Award, I'm going to be joined by Frank Meerkamp, member of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors and General Manager at Accenture. So this award tonight is, going to be, is given to select men and women whose extraordinary accomplishments and fresh ideas are shaping the 21st century. At its simplest, our 21st Century Visionary Award is to honor the leaders who are changing the world for the better. We, we look for the champions, the innovators, the creative groundbreakers, and the thought leaders who are, above all, among the visionaries who will help lead us forward. We've, got, we've given this award to literary master and social philanthropist Dave Eggers, YouTube founders Chad Hurley and Steve Chen, education entrepreneur Sal Khan, Van Jones, Cecile Richards, King Abdullah of Jordan, and many, many more inspiring figures. This year, Inform is proud to honor Marissa Meyer, CEO of Yahoo. When Marissa Meyer became CEO of Yahoo, she became the youngest woman at 37 to lead a Fortune 500 company. <laughs> 15 years before she became the tech powerhouse she is today, Maya was hired as the 20th employee at Google. Maya was instrumental in the success of Google Search and played a critical role in developing and defining many of its popular products, uh, such as Google Maps, Google News, Gmail, and Chrome. In just two years at Yahoo, Maya has reimagined all of its core products, including Mail, Flickr, and more, and introduced new mobile products such as Yahoo Weather, News Digest, which have both won design awards. In addition, Maya has acquired more than 40 companies, including Tumblr. Her boldness has made her a household name, and we are pleased to award Marissa Maya Inform's Treasury Visionary Award but before we present Marissa with, with this award, there's someone who would like to pass on his congratulations from afar. Mr. Mayor, for all you have done and for all you will do, please accept the 21st, the Inform 21st Century Visionary Award. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here at the historic Castro Theater tonight. I'm an admirer of the Commonwealth Club as the leading forum for innovative ideas and debate. And I'm so honored by tonight's award. It's really meaningful to me to join such an amazing group of past honorees. So I want to take a moment and thank the board of Inforum, the Commonwealth Club, Accenture, as well as Eric for his kind words, and also for my family, who I'm lucky to have with me tonight and who does an amazing job supporting me. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Marissa. And uh, if everybody could please welcome onto the stage our moderator for this evening, Mark Benioff. Sail <laughs> 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 
the CEO of Salesforce.com, but needs no introduction. <laughs> plugged in? We are. Okay, Marissa, uh, congratulations on this amazing award. It's great to be with you tonight. And it's great to be with everybody here. And how about those giants? <laughs> so Marissa, what do you think about the giants? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of them, but they made getting here tonight very challenging, I think, for all of us. So. But it'll be a terrific parade tomorrow, I'm sure. <laughs> um, Marissa, uh, we know each other very well, and uh, you know what? I'll tell you what my goal is for the um, interview, which is um, I want to, as I mentioned backstage, kind of you know get you to relax. You've just gotten off the road. You're, you have such a busy day, um, but also one of the things that I just have admired about you and. You know, you, you have this long, incredible list of accomplishments at such a young age. I mean, everybody knows your incredible success with Google and Yahoo and also all the incredible civic achievements that you've had. But on a personal level, one of the things that I've really uh, admired about you is your personality and how you are able to tell these amazing stories about your life. And we've talked about that. And I really, uh, want to kind of start with that a little bit because you've had all these amazing experiences and somehow you're able to weave these together in some amazing poetry and and my goal tonight is uh, hopefully to kind of pull that out of you because I've seen that happen so many incredible times before and I'm sure you're about to do that now as well. Um, one, one thing that's been really amazing uh, to me is to watch this transition from this incredible rising star at Google to now the CEO of Yahoo. Your vision there, your direction, you've also been ex incredibly aggressive in acquiring companies. I think you've acquired maybe 40 companies in, in, in just a couple of years. I mean, it's pretty awesome. And you're repopulating Yahoo with all these innovators and how these leaders. When you were at Google, I remember very clearly uh, a time that we were together and you were telling me a story um, because you had just gotten back from a, an around the world trip and you had gotten on an airplane and you had taken all these incredible young people with you just to show them the world. And I just thought to myself, how does she know that that is so important to creating these young leaders? Where did that come from? Well, um, it was more than about just showing people the world. It was also, you know, hopefully had a, more of a purpose than that. Um, but. We had this program at Google called the Associate Product Manager Program, where we took people who were computer scientists who had really great ideas about how to apply technology to problems. And we'd bring them in and give them way too much responsibility and basically yell at them and coach them until they really uh, started bringing these, these amazing products to life. But for them, you know, they'd only been just you know, a year out of school. And you know, after they, they would get hired out of school, they'd be, they'd be at Google for a year. And you'd be asking them to design products for you know, Japan. You'd be asking them to design products for Russia. And they had never been those in those places and never seen, let alone like what the culture is, let alone you know, how, how technology would be used or how people would use Google uh, in those cases um, in those different countries. And so I just thought it was incredibly important to go and actually see wait, like these are the challenges, this is what works well, this isn't what works, and th this is why this makes sense in this context. And so, you know, the, those trips for me were always huge learning experiences. I would do about one a year. They were amazing because, you know, you get away from the everyday and it starts to give you all kinds of ideas about the things you could build or you might build or that you might try. But it was also just amazing to see all of those rising stars really you know, get their own ideas, have their experiences, and you know, and really watch people shine. I think there were like, there were all kinds of amazing uh, different product ideas that came out of those trips. But there was also the, this this thing that would tend to happen, which is that that the the APMs would all have kind of their own special superpower, 
right? There'd be like the one who could just read subway maps faster than everyone else, <laughs> right? And there would also be like the person who actually managed to communicate best with hand gestures in a language that they couldn't speak. And you would just sort of see these amazing traits come out in people. And it was just really inspiring opportunity to not only learn a lot about the world, but also learn a lot about these people who've gone on to do just amazing things in technology. When you were on these trips and um, I remember you coming back from one of them specifically, and I think you had just been in India or something like this, and you were really telling me about the future of video, and that you had had this experience where you were in a room, I think, in either Google, India, or some, and you were having this kind of, and you came back, you said, I've seen the future of video, we can do this, we, can, we have, and then you just were able to kind of go on, when did you realize that you were going to have these visions and be able to see the future so clearly? Um, well, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't really think of them as visions. To me, I see ideas. I see ideas, and you know, I think that when I, for me, for me, I see an idea from someone, and I'm able to hopefully shape it, shepherd it, um, and execute it in that vision and bring it to something that's really meaningful. I mean, I've been lucky uh, in life to really work alongside tremendous entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, from the acquisitions, Larry, Sergey, now, now Dave and Jerry, and like really following the footsteps of, of some of the greats, and and get to to see their vision, take their ideas, and say, okay, how can I help execute on this? How can I help bring this to life and have this be something that's really meaningful? You know, for and the, you know, the amazing thing about the internet is the way that you can just reach so many people that you can uh, and make it immediately impactful to hundreds of millions or a billion people. When did you first realize that? Well, I think it was interesting for me that I had gone um, on, uh, I had been working really hard at Google uh, for about a year, and I ended up in Switzerland. I'd done an internship in Switzerland before I joined Google, and I was eager to go back. Uh, and, you know, those, that first, you know, I think a lot of people now, Google has become, you know, this is worldwide phenomenon and success, but at the time, you know, it was a, 100 hour, 130 hour a week job, you know, like no time to go home, no time to like sleep, eat, shower. It was like you had to really think things through. And it, you know, as a result, like I had missed how much Google had grown and built a following. And so I remember going into a cyber cafe. You remember cyber cafes? Like they're still popular some places, but you know, they used to be kind of everywhere. I remember going into a cyber cafe, so it must have been like 2000 in. Switzerland, and you know when you see something that you see every day, like you know the logo from your college or like from your company, it doesn't even really at first register to you that you're seeing it someplace that you don't expect to see it. And I remember walking in uh, to the cyber cafe, seeing the Google logo, and then like doing a double take and realizing, like, oh wait, like this this little site that I'm working on with my friends, <laughs> you know, like there's you know in, in, a, in a small group, it's actually somehow made it almost halfway around the world. And I think that for me that really drove home that notion that like we hadn't asked that person to use Google. We really wondered, there were days at Google when we wondered if the only people using it were our family and friends who we had actually told about it. Um, but you know, that notion that a great product, a great technology could just start to jump borders and start to take on a life of its own and just get this incredible reach was you know, really evident to me there and then even more so in the, in the years to come. Now, you somehow took that concept, that idea that the internet would be pervasive, we could go everywhere to kind of impact, um, you know, everyone in the world, but you coupled it with something that you also had an intuitive sense for, and I think this is what surprised everyone. And I remember when I first met you, it was at the San Francisco Symphony, and you were wearing this incredible uh, ball gown. And I think maybe you were in your mid twenties, and I was like, um, "She has a sense of design as well." Then I noticed that you also then joined, I think, the board of the MoMA. I had an opportunity to see the inside of your house and your apartment, and you probably have one of the most incredible collections of art that I've ever seen. And in my mind, I put all that together, and I s said, "This." focus on design is something that's really coming through her just innately, intuitively. 
And so you started to put design and you coupled it with the power of the internet. And that's obviously what made Google, Google. We all know that. You, you were able to bring that together in a way that none of us had ever seen that before. So when, when, when did that open up for you? And when did you, those two things integrate so nicely? Um, I, I wish I could say that it's, that it's me, but it's not. And there's, there's two people who deserve a lot more credit than that, which is that my mother's an art teacher and my father's an engineer. <laughs> and the cross product of that is someone who like, you know, really loves technology. Um, I wasn't as good an artist as my mother is, so she taught me a lot about art history and a lot about respect for, for art and design, but really seeing how you know, engineering and art aren't all that different. And that there's a lot of, there's a lot of symmetry between the two disciplines. And you know, engineering that isn't beautiful you know, has its, its drawbacks. And, and art that isn't engineered it also in some ways is, is less interesting. And so, you know, for me, it was always part of my life growing up. The two just always coexisted because they coexisted in my family and in my, and in my role models. So I don't think I've ever had anyone said that before. So engineering and art aren't that different. So can you, can you, I mean, I think everyone, you know, what is that? Tell me about that. That, that, that's my view anyway. I mean, I think that, you know, I think when you look at some of the most interesting art of the day, I mean, I, I love bright, happy, shiny things. So, you know, like the artists that I really admire are like Anish Kapoor or Jeff Koons. I mean, you look at like, what does it take to craft these incredibly enormous, you know, heavy sculptures, uh, you know, to figure out like, you know, then to add this degree of how do you have to polish them? What are the processes you need to go through to get that visual effect? You know, I mean, it's really engineering. Um, and at the same time, when you have a really amazing piece of technology that's well engineered, it thinks about how that piece of, you know, people will have thought a lot about how that technology needs to be used to really bring that to the forefront. And that was certainly something that we always tried to do at Google, we try to do today at Yahoo, uh, is to basically say, okay, well, wait, there's all this technology and it can be incredibly complicated but it doesn't need to necessarily present itself as being incredibly contemplated and incredibly engineered. There is an element of simplicity of just being able to say, look, this t yes, I'm sure it is very complicated behind the scenes, but to me, it's just a search box. Or to me, it's just a digest of today's news. Uh, to me, you know, yes, it's the weather, but as, as, as technical as the weather is, it can also be a beautiful photograph from Flickr really pulling together that notion that you can actually pull engineering, information, artistry all together to create something that's really beautiful and it isn't just useful, it also has an emotional experience. And are, are you looking for that emotional experience when you're looking at these new products, these engineers are bringing, you know, they're bringing them into your, you know, review, to review with you. Is, is that what you're waiting for, the emotional experience inside yourself? Or how, how, are you, how are you bringing that forward? Well, I think that, you know, I, I, I've always loved design. I think that the, one of the most fun parts of being at Yahoo is that everything is a design problem, right? You know, in terms of how do we hire the right people? How do we pick the right acquisitions to pursue? You know, how do we approach, say, pitching advertising? Or how do we design the service? It's all, all part of, a, of an inter really interesting and the most intricate and amazing design problem I've ever gotten to work on. Um, and, and when it comes to products, what you really want to do is instill values in the company. And Yahoo's had this since the beginning of being really approachable, friendly. You can just, you know, the brand has a personality. And as a result, the people there in the culture, I think, intuitively get that. And they bring products that have that personality, that emotional experience. Um, but even if it's just something like, you know, taking something like the weather or your email and beautifying it with photographs and, you know, colors that really, you know, speak to you, it, it, it you know, Yahoo in particular is a lot about personalization and how can we take sports, news, weather, finance, mail, and really make it feel in that, you know, it's tailored to you, it's customized for you. Yes, it brings some of Yahoo's personality through, but it's really what you need to know, when you need to know it, with an element of serendipity. And so are you trying to couple that serendipity with that emotional experience? Absolutely, because the, the two are tied. There's that element of surprise that I think, you know, causes, um, causes people to you know, have such an amazing emotion. Uh, I was really 
uh, one of the most fun things I did at Google over the years, uh, which was very different than my day job, was working on the homepage logos. And I fell into it in a really crazy way because I was you know, working on our front end web server um, and, and literally just to sort of drive home how, how brutally difficult those first few years at Google were. There was a, there was a Sunday night, uh, Sunday Halloween that year. So it was almost, I guess, 15 years ago, uh, probably this weekend. Uh, it was a Sunday Halloween. We were literally all in the office on Saturday night working and coding at two in the morning. And I remember Sergey Brin coming, running into my office and said, Marissa, Marissa, I want to show you something. And I said, OK, because I needed a break kind of anyway. And he said, you know, go to Tilda Sergey, his, you know, his, internal, uh, his internal folder. And he's like, click on Halloween.gif. And so I clicked on it. And it was the Google logo replaced with two pumpkins where the O's were. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, oh, that's, that's cute, Sergey. You've, you know, you've replaced the, the O's with pumpkins. And he said, yeah, isn't it cute? He's like, put it on the home page. And I said, you want me to put that on the home page? Uh, and he said, yes, like, why not? And I said, well, you know, but, but Sergey, like, they're just clip art pumpkins. <laughs> and he said, yes. And I said, and like, like they're, they're pixelated around the edges because you can see these like little like square <laughs> edges. And because I can see how you just scaled them up. And he's like, so? And I said, and also, like, you, you didn't cover the red O very well because I can, I can see it peeking out here <laughs> at the bottom. And he said, so? And I said, you want me to put this on the home page? And he said, you know, look, it will tell our users that, yes, there's people here who are working and that we're excited for Halloween. Um, and I said, OK. And I was skeptical, put it up on the, on the home page. And at the time, the, the forum of the day was a forum called Slashdot. Uh, and I remember logging on to Slashdot, and there were just hundreds of comments. And the element of it was that, that piece of serendipity, because of, even at the time, the people who used Google, it had become so much a utility that you would just use it every day. It was almost like your tube of toothpaste. And then all of a sudden, one day, you logged in, and there was something there about the people who worked there and what they were excited about, and this little flare of personality. And I think that it was just that element of humanity that just suddenly shone through that, that, that really drew people in. And it was an important lesson for me, because now I think about how can you, on products, pull in that little bit of serendipity, because it creates this emotional connection. And it says something about the people who work on the product and what they love. And so you know, whether it's the, the, the photos on Flickr, uh, from Flickr now on the weather application. So if it's raining in Tokyo and you go and see Tokyo weather, you actually see you know, downtown Tokyo with all the umbrellas. Um, and you know, or if it's something like the News Digest, that at the end of reading the news, it just assures, it reassures you that you're done. Right? Suddenly there's this voice of a person. So there are, how many people here have the News Digest? If you don't, I really encourage you to try it. Was, it was created to talk about an amazing entrepreneur. Um, I, I didn't want to buy a 17-year-old's company. Um, and I tried very hard not to. Um, but we needed some summarization technology. And we scoured the globe. And it turned out that the, the leading summarization technology of the day was actually helmed by um, a 17-year-old in the UK named Mick Delosio. And so we bought, we bought his company, Sumly. We deployed it across Yahoo products to summarize our articles. And after that, Nick had this amazing second idea, which was, could he summarize the news of the day into 7 to 11 top stories, uh, publish them as a morning edition and an evening edition? Uh, and so whether you basically get a notice once in the morning that the morning digest is ready, and once in the evening that the evening digest is ready. Uh, and then the big hook in it is at the end of the News Digest, once you've read you know, all seven stories or however many stories it takes to summarize that day's news, it actually lights up green, does this little animation, and says, that's it, you're done. <laughs> and, and, um, and, if, and it says, I think it has a little notice on the bottom, if you're a news junkie and you want more, you can pull down for more. But it was so amazing to see Nick come up with this idea, and I just, because you know, he's grown up in this just endless stream of information. And you know, when I asked him about it, I said, you know, why, why seven, why 11? He said, well, look, you know, the whole world right now is so infinite. Everything is an infinite feed, an infinite scroll. And he's like, I think people will just like it if there's a finite number of things and we tell them when they're done. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so like, literally, you use the application at the end, and it comes up and it says, like, you're done. 
Um, and I think that people even like that emotional connection. And it's really amazing to like look at the reviews on the app stores of News Digest because it's, it's a really it's, it's the most highly rated and most downloaded news app I think on both the Android store and on iTunes. And if you read the comments, what people love about it is they're like, finally, an app that tells me I'm done. <laughs> and so you know, it's that those elements of design and humanity, serendipity that come through that I think really drive a connection between a product and its users. One word you didn't use in that description was mobile. And we're moving into a mobile world and smartwatches and everyone here has got a phone or two with them. And um, you know, when you combine those ideas, and especially the serendipity idea, the design idea, the humanity idea, and you link it into mobile, is mobile an amplifier on all of this? Is it some, how, how do you have to conceptualize all of this in a world of mobile? Uh, I think about, I mean, I'm just amazed by mobile and it's changed our industry so profoundly and just so much faster, I think, than anyone expected. Right? The fact that in 2013 people spent more time on their digital devices, largely, largely driven by mobile, than they did watching television for the first time in American history is really pretty amazing. And I don't think any of us expected that crossover point to happen so quickly and be fueled so much by mobile. Um, but for me, mobile is a wave. Right, and you know, I think that one of the things we're, we're, you know, that we think about a lot at Yahoo is transformation. And when you look at all of the successful transformations and reinventions in technology, they all involve waves. You know, arguably, IBM, you know, rode the wave to, from you know mainframes to services. Apple arguably invented the wave around mobile and rode that back to just you know incredible, incredible success and relevance. Amazon didn't even really need to invent a wave, but they invented this wave of web services, Salesforce, you know, taking, um, you know, taking enterprise software and offering it as software as a service and really utilizing the cloud. Right? When you see these amazing rises in, in technology, a lot of times it's fueled by these big industry shifts that essentially create waves. And you know, when you're thinking about how to reinvent or transform something, it's daunting because a lot of times in technology you really need that platform shift to ride and it is like surfing if there's no waves like you can't surf right you it's hard to reinvent but right now there's this amazing wave that's just taking over technology information services which is mobile uh, and it's big enough to I think you know cause so many different companies to really you know thrive and succeed and really be able to catch that catch that wave and be able to provide such amazing things when you look at the wave of mobile do you see another big wave riding behind that, or do you think that this is a wave that we are going to ride for quite some time? I think, there's a couple, I think there's a couple of waves. I think mobile will be very big for a very long time, and a lot of it depends on how you define it. I think that there's going to be an amazing uh, amount of, of technology uh, and insight we all get from wearables. I think it's early days there. And I mean, you can argue that that's an extension of mobile, um, but I think it's... it's uh, pretty amazing. I think when you look at video and television, uh, when you look at some of what Apple's doing, even with like continuity, being able to throw things, you know, it's starting to look more and more like Minority Report, where if you're like, wait, I can I actually just flick something from my tablet onto a screen on the wall if I want to show it to a larger group of people? I think there's going to be a lot there in terms of how we all consume information, but particularly video and being able to just move it easily across screens. That's arguably an extension of, of mobile too, but I think that wearables and large format screens uh, are going to be some of the next frontiers we see. Is there going to be a connection between video and, and uh, that kind of serendipity that you're talking about? I, I think absolutely. I think that when you look at how we all consume video today, uh, people always want to know what should I be watching? Uh, you know, what would I not have known about if not for a suggestion from a friend or, you know, from a personalization uh, offering? And so I think that there, you know, there's definitely an element of serendipity. We all want to know about the latest, greatest things that appeal to us most. And there's so much media being generated today. Uh, and our consumption of it is becoming more and more fragmented. Um, you know, there's interesting stats we've looked at, like the, the series finale of MASH was watched by 106 million people. Uh, to, like last year, Breaking Bad, the series finale was watched by 10 million people. 
and only two million people watched it without multitasking. Right? So if you say, like, you know, well now I mean, that's considered a massive audience. <laughs> But that's considered, you know, now, now today, like 2 million, 10 million is considered a massive audience when it used to be hundreds of millions. And so when you think about how do you find that audience, right, and, and, and get the right content to them, and how do you harness all of that amazing media, but everyone liking something different and wanting to see something different, it's an amazing, it's an amazing data and design problem in terms of how to get people the very best and most important things for them. So are you suggesting that data science will become an important part of this uh, future? I mean, hugely. I think that when you, you know, the, the amount of data we all generate today that actually gets harnessed, analyzed, again, I think it's just early days in terms of how good these suggestions can get and how well we can all learn from the information about ourselves, be it our viewing habits or our steps per day, our sleep, all of these different uh, all, all of these different things, and so I think that that's, that's something that's going to be just a tremendous wave of change. So software, not just that serendipitous, but also smarter, you, you must, the serendipity and the smartness must be connected very deeply. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, uh, my degrees were all in artificial intelligence, because I just think it's so interesting to think about a computer that could be as smart or smarter uh, than all of us, and I, and I don't really subscribe to the, will they be able to make, you know, decisions for us, but I do think that they can learn, they can, you know, do exhaustive searches through spaces and data in a way that's much faster than us, and I think that, you know, we were talking just the other day about, you know, the old expert systems and then kind of the winter of AI where everyone thought AI had really peaked, and now when you look at what's happening with all the machine learning algorithms in particular, deep learning, but all of these different elements, those are really the rock stars today of computer science, are these, these deep learning, machine learning scientists who can just take petabytes, exabytes of data, harness it, and come up with just an amazing insight. So coupling that back to this kind of serendipitous world, a world where these computers are learning, they're mobile, um, they're drones, they're flying also, they're, where, 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 where does this get connected to? How do, you, how do you see that moving forward? Well, I think that you know, there's this interesting, I, I think the drones piece is intriguing. I haven't thought enough about it, but I do think that when you look at the transformations that happen in technology, they always say that people tend to overestimate the short term and underestimate the long term. And I always think back to when I was five, watching the Jetsons, and I was like, oh, this will be awesome, because when, like, when I'm 30, they'll be flying cars. Um, and if you look at it, you know, like today, I'm almost 40, and there's, there's no flying cars. There's nothing even close to a flying car. Um, and, uh, and at least certainly not at scale, but when you look at the way the internet has just transformed and changed everything from cloud computing to the way we all get information to the way we do research, all communicate, mobile devices, and you know, I think it's, you know, it's, it feels to me like it's time for some of that innovation and some of that huge transformation to actually start to you know, move over into the transportation sector. And I think that's what you're starting to see with things like self-driving cars and hopefully eventually flying cars and drones is this notion of, well, wait, can we get so good with information and mobility and processing it all that we can actually start to make the problem of getting from here to there or having eyes somewhere where you can't, where you can't be or having something done for you where you can't be uh, really becomes a profound possibility. Uh, coming back to your ideas of design and humanity and serendipity, I mean, are you going to, the, the, will the software be reading your Yahoo schedule and then your, your, uh, your, uh, your uh, car will be waiting for you outside the Castro because it, it, it will have known that you need, uh, need a ride home? I can, I can only hope, but, uh, but uh, um, I, I think that, yeah, I mean, I, I, you'll decide how much information you want to give up. Uh, to these systems, and you know, I, all, I personally believe that the data always belongs to you, and I think the systems that violate that barrier, you know, they need access to the data, it belongs to you, but you give them access, you can also choose to deny access whenever you'd like, but, but it will become a trade-off that everyone will make in terms of saying, wait, you know, when can I, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm willing to give up this information about myself, allow that, that uh, system to have access because it makes my life so much more convenient. Right, I think that, you know, um, 
Uber is such an amazing service. Um, and you know, you might think, well, it's always kind of scary to have your credit card on file. I was always very skeptical of that, and, you know, with other services. But you know, with Uber, you're like, it's just so great to be able to like take the take the Uber, get out of the car, and it just gets paid for, not even thinking about it. You just get emailed the receipt later. That you start to say, you know what? It's totally fine for you to keep my credit card. I get it. It makes things a lot easier. And so I think that people will start to make trade-offs like that because it just creates so much more ease of use. So Uber will be connected to my schedule and uh, cars will just be showing up <laughs> wherever I well, am. I don't know. I know your, your, your schedule is pretty hairy. <laughs> and I, I imagine it changes a lot from, from time to time. But, uh, but I do think that that notion of just really you know, being able to concentrate on what you want to concentrate on. And I think that when you think about it, we all spend way too much time on logistics. Where if you're like, wait, like the logistical pieces of this are actually pretty easy to understand, study, and wire up such that they're a lot more convenient for you. I think that that's something that I know, at least for myself, that's something I would want. Um, so tonight, were you thinking that you would wish that you were in a in a car that had data science and route planning and... I, I was in a car that had data science and route planning. It's just that the, uh, as I said, the, the, the giants parade. <laughs> like, I'm not sure that like exactly, I think the barricades must have gone up early. A, I'm not drone. sure how we would have actually gotten that programmed in, but yeah. <laughs> like, ahead, making, figuring out where you were gonna go next. Would have been nice, yes. <laughs> um, you know, you're, you've mentioned a lot of really important topics. Um, you know, the, the idea that software is becoming more human, that it has this inherent sense of uh, simplicity, that it has a sense of serendipity. You have talked, you've talked about now how it's learning and how it's um, integrated um, more into our lives than ever before. Um, one of the things that um, we heard I think in the last two or three weeks is uh, Elon Musk has been talking about some of these trends, especially uh, in the worlds of artificial intelligence and deep learning. You know, he's made these big headlines where he thinks this is one of the great, you know, threats to humanity. Do you, do you agree with him? Uh, well, I haven't, I haven't looked at his, his arguments and his analysis enough, but I would say that, you know, I, I for one don't think that we're there yet. That is to say that we might not if we aren't careful uh, but I think that today, you know, ultimately these are all algorithms written by us on, on hardware designed and, and built by, by humans as well. And I think that we have more control over how it gets deployed and particularly what, what data it accesses, how, how it, it gets used than a lot of people think. And so I think we're pretty far away from, you know, the machines taking over or an existential threat. That's just my opinion. But. I think he said that Google was, what was the name of that computer in the Terminator, cyber, somebody or another, that uh, do you think that that's you know, possible, that Google has that much intelligence, knowledge of us, you know, awareness around, around the world? Um, I mean, I think that you know, when you look at the information that Google has or that Yahoo has, uh, I think that there's certainly a lot of data it's a big responsibility. We need to have a really clear covenant with our users in terms of what information we have, how it's being used, giving a lot of choice to users. It really comes down to transparency, choice, and control, and really putting that in the hands of the users and being clear about who owns, who, who owns the data. But I also think that, again, these are things that people get accustomed to over time. Because when you look at other industries, you know, your credit card knows an incredible amount about you. Uh, your you know, internet service provider doesn't just have you know, the, the articles you've read on Yahoo and the searches that you've done. It has all of the different things that you've looked at uh, online. And so, but these are things where you know, people either haven't thought about it or they thought about it and they've done it for so long that it's something they're comfortable with because they understand how it works. And I think that not, in that regard, technology is challenged because we're reasonably new science, a rising industry, people aren't as accustomed. To, to this, I'm sure you face this with Salesforce. People say, well, wait, I'm not comfortable with my proprietary information being hosted up in the cloud. Like, what is the cloud? How do I make sure that I have the controls that I know I need? How do, I, how do you get transparent views into it? These are things that are going to present themselves in, in new industries because people just aren't accustomed to them. That said, when you start to look for 
real world, longer standing paradigms. There's, there's certainly things that we all share in terms of data about ourselves that make our lives better, like credit cards, phone records, you know, internet service provider logs, all of those, all of those types of things um, that ultimately also come with a lot of benefits. With, with all of these, with all of these features and benefits, is opting out even a reality for for us anymore? I, I think I think you can opt out. Um, but it was sort of funny because I, I try I don't actually read articles, but I saw an article the other day that I think misquoted me in the headline and it said, you know, something like Marissa says privacy nuts will have a less awesome life online. And I don't think I actually said that exactly that way. Um, but I do I do think that. Like I think that today if you start saying, you know what, like you're not allowed to have this information about me, um, you know, it, it's amazing. Uh, I have amazing ads on Yahoo. Like, you know, but I literally, when I project my laptop at work, people will be like, look at that ad, look at this ad. They're, they're beautiful, they're tailored to my taste, they're for things like method soap and, you know, skis, which I love, I love skiing. I mean, like, they, it's really, you know, it's figured me out. And I was like, you know, like, I for one recognize that the content Yahoo offers me gets better because it is able to understand what I've looked at in the past and what I like. The ads get better, they're much more beautiful, they're really enriching to the experience. And so I think that you know it's pretty undeniable that if you were to say turn on do not track on your browser, say store no cookies, and actually start to try and use the web today, that your web experience would be you know really not nearly as good as if you actually allowed a few sites that you trust or the majority of sites if you sort of wanted to default opt in and then opt out to sites that you distrust. I think that that's a much better approach. When you look at um, that juxtaposition against watching that TV show of the Jetsons, and those ads were just the same ads that everyone was getting in kind of this world that's highly one-to-one, -one, um, you know, what, what's, what's the most dramatic benefit do you think that we're going to kind of experience in, in, in the next, you know, three to five years? Oh, um, I think that, you know, that's really, it's really interesting to, to see and think about. I think that, you know, there's the spaces that I'm really passionate about. I think that search is going to change in profound ways. I think that the way we all communicate, you know, there's just so many new ideas in terms of, of, of how we all message each other and, and, and how that can work. I think there's a lot to do there and obviously, and obviously content consumption, but a lot of my ideas start to move towards things like what's going to happen uh, with healthcare and or at least how we all understand our own healthfulness. Um, what's going to you know, happen with the environment in terms of our ability to measure and really understand data. You know, um, looking at you know, Google Earth, it, you know, it would always amaze me that there was one year where we got called to go in and, uh, and present at a climate, the, the big climate change conference you know, globally. And at first I was sort of puzzled. I was like, well, look, obviously Google Earth admires the Earth. And there's, there's an element there. But the really profound thing was that the, a lot of the researchers that work in the space were actually using the images to compute the depth of rainforest canopies. Which when you start to think about like what does that mean in terms of the data we're all collecting, what we can learn about what we're all doing to the planet, how we can you know, potentially reverse that, change that, monitor different forestation policies. It's really sharp, you can look at some countries uh, in Africa and South America where the different, you can literally see on the satellite based on the depth of the, of the rainforest canopy where the country borders are because one country will have a different deforestation policy than the country next to it. So I think that when I start looking at the next three to five years, I think that we're going to start to see really profound shifts move, shifting moves forward in health, uh, in the environment, education, and you know, those are all areas where you know, Yahoo gets to play in the edge and, um, and gets to participate through search, through communications, through digital content. Um, but you know, I think that there's, just, there's so much to do there that it's really exciting. We're in a real education crisis in the United States, especially in uh, K to 12, and especially in our public schools and in pre-K, do you think that this, these kind of technologies can can help help some of these issues? Well, I think that when you education hasn't evolved enough, right? And I think that when you look at how much you know everything else has evolved, how do you actually uh, you know you know get education? 
to, to take a different tact. And I mean, uh, you know, Sal Khan was one of the former winners of this award. Huge appreciation and respect for what he's done. I think this notion of flipping the classroom and having you, you know, watch the lecture and the learning at night and then actually doing the problems, you know, with a teacher and with your fellow classmates the next day is, is really interesting in these sort of sh shorter snippets of, of learning in the form of shorter lectures. I think all of that's really thought provoking. Um, but there's still an element of conventionalism in it in terms of it's still a lecture. And the question is, can we make learning much more interesting and much more and much more engaging, much more adaptive and, and, uh, and personalized? More serendipitous? Sure, absolutely. Well, I think you've done a beautiful job uh, showing everyone in this audience why you are very well deserved of the Visionary Award. And thank you very much, Marissa. And so now we're going to open this up uh, and um, ask uh, for uh, questions. And um, there's microphones in the uh, in the hallways, in the not in the hallways, in the what are these aisles? In the aisles, yes. Not a professional moderator, actually. I actually have a day job. <laughs> on the far wall. <laughs> that was awesome. All right. And I can't see anybody, but I can see rough shadows of people. Wow. So if you could just tell us your name and who you are, maybe where you live, and, uh, and then your question. <laughs> Uh, my name's Amanda. Um, I work at a uh, startup um, in uh, Soma, uh, and I'm a Berkeley CS grad. Um, so my question would be, um, uh, for, for me, like you, uh, I had my parents were in engineering and pushed me into that at a very young age. Um, and throughout um, my time as a uh, CS student, like e even uh, in like middle school and high school, I saw fewer and fewer women being interested in these fields. Um, and even in college, I saw like a lot of very technical women, very extremely smart women, feeling like like they're they're not good enough to do that. Um, and then even out of college, um, I saw a lot of women uh, uh, find a different career rather than uh, being software developers um, and move away from this like this this te these technical fields. Um, so my question for you is, um, what do you uh, what do you think the problem there is, or one of the problems, um, and how do you think we can solve it? Sure, I think I'll I'll take it in two parts. I think that there. Um, I'll, I'll address it first because I think that there is potentially an issue uh, in terms of girls versus boys. Um, and then I also think that there's just an issue just in terms of sheer scale. Um, I think that one of the things, I, for me, I got into computers late. I literally bought my first computer when I was a freshman in college, took my first program. I, was, I thought I would be a doctor. I didn't take my first programming course uh, until freshman year spring. I, it was actually a course at Stanford called CS105. The, the lecturer opened a class by saying, you know, relax everyone, there's 400 of you here, and studies have shown that only two of you will ever go on to take another computer science class. <laughs> True story, that was my first programming class, and then I loved it so much that I went on to take more. But I thought a lot, I thought a lot about why didn't I get into programming sooner, and part of it was it just wasn't the thing to do, but part of it was that for the folks who, who were in my, who were sort of, you know, of, of my generation and era, at, Stanford, there were a lot more boys because they saw things like video games, and then they would get interested in how do you make that. And for me, I think that one of the things that will happen naturally with women as we start to do more with wearables, large formats of screens, mobile, is that as technology starts to touch your life, every day I think intellectually curious girls are going to start to say, wait, like how do you make this? How does this work? And I think it will naturally cause more to happen. And so I don't think we really know right now for the girls who are, you know, 9, 12, 15 years old right now, are they going to be more or less interested uh, in, in technology? And I, and I hope that the incredible things that have happened with technology in, say, the last decade that have really shaped their lives are something that they're interested in saying, hey, how do I do that? How do I participate in that? But I would also say that I think that there's an issue around scale. Um, one of my great mentors is a, a professor at Stanford named Eric Roberts, and he thinks a lot about computer science education at large. He got really involved with the advanced placement 
group um, in terms of preparing high school seniors. One of the things he found was that there are 200,000 graduating seniors from high school every year that take the AP calculus test. There are 14,000 seniors who take the AP computer science test. So only 7%, if you say, okay, well, people who are good at math will also be good at computer science. The truth is, and when they come, go to graduate from high school, only 7% of those who are taking advanced calculus and taking the test to get, to get credit in college are actually going, are also taking the computer science test. And I'm sure there's not even 100% overlap. But the point is, if we can start driving that 14% up closer to the 200, that 14,000, the 7%, up closer to the 200,000, that growth will have to come from somewhere. So I, for one, am less worried about women in computer science and girls in computer science. I think that that will start to correct itself. But the real issue is we just aren't producing enough computer scientists, period, or enough people, even if they don't end up being full-on computer scientists, people who are really comfortable with software engineering. And so I think that part of it is how do we take that discipline and start expanding its participation at a much younger age so it feels more like math. And, then the, and as we do that, there will naturally be a lot more girls in absolute numbers, and I would guess even in relative numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Olivia. I'm visiting San Francisco from Hawaii. Um, I wanted to um, ask you about, um, sort of about your role in, in social media and your role kind of as a public figure. Um, a little less than a year ago, I wrote to you on Twitter and said, you've inspired me to pursue computer science. And you actually wrote back and said, good luck in CS. And that was, that was deeply affirming to me. So thank you so much. <laughs> I'm glad I get to thank you in person. Um, what I wanted to ask you about actually was, um, was Although um, it's so great that you would reach out to people and reaching out to me, that was, that was a huge for me. Um, but while that was sort of a positive um, thing, there's a lot of, as a public figure, you know, you get a lot of criticism, some fair and a lot, frankly, not fair. Um, and I wanted to know from sort of a, from your perspective, um, how do you handle criticism from others um, about you, about Yahoo, um, from um, shareholders and, and really anybody else since you're talking about a kind of, a, barrage of, of information, that there's a barrage of, of comments. Um, so I wanted to ask sort of how you handle criticism about yourself and how you kind of keep it, you know, kind of come back to yourself and, and restore your confidence. Well, I, I appreciate the question. I think that, by the way, first of all, thank you for providing a bright spot in my Twitter feed. <laughs> it's always nice to hear from a, a woman who's thinking about pursuing computer science as opposed to someone who's having issues with their Yahoo Mail, um, which I answer quite a lot of, <laughs> which is probably the most common thing that happens in my Twitter feed. And by the way, I do respond to all of those too and refer them to Yahoo Care, and we get people help, to hopefully in really short order. Um, but I, so I, I do think it's important. I know for me, I was, Eric Roberts was one of the people who really encouraged me and said, you know, reached out to me and said, look, you're really good at computer science. You should think more about this, and that, and that really matters. And I think that, you know, as humans, we all respond better to praise sometimes than to criticism. And I think that, you know, um, I once read a piece on Margaret Thatcher uh, where she talked about the fact that she never read public criticisms uh, and or public praise, frankly, of herself because she felt like it really pulled her off her center and made her think differently about things, made her more likely to stay with a position or more likely to move away from a position because after she had seen what someone else thought of her saying it, it just changed how, how she thought about it. And so, you know, I would say now, it's like been about five years ago, I, I stopped reading basically criticism, praise, articles in general. I still read Twitter, so I see the headlines. And if I see a headline enough, I'll, I'll ask my husband to read it and summarize it for me. <laughs> because it always sounds better coming from someone who loves you <laughs> than it does actually reading it. Um, you know, in a less intellectual way, I remember Bradley Cooper once said, if you ever want to really feel bad about yourself, go ahead and read about yourself online. Um, and so, but I think that for all those reasons, for me, I mean, the way I think that it's important to let the criticism in, way that's really constructive. And so everyone will have a different way for, for dealing with it. You want to understand what those criticisms are because in all criticism there are some elements of truth and that's why it hurts and that's why when you learn about it you can actually improve yourself. Uh, but it's also important not to let it in so much that it changes who you are or what you want to pursue. I'm 
Zico. I'm 10, and I like programming, and I was wondering what's your favorite language in programming? Oh, that, that's an amazing, that's an amazing question. What, what have you programmed um, lately? I do JavaScript, HTML, C++, and a few others. I want her to do a That, that is absolutely amazing, and my, my, I would say my favorite programming language is probably C, though I love my JavaScript too, so I think we're, we speak the same programming languages. <laughs> Hi, my name's Peter Gisela, I'm from Santa Rosa, I work in a hospital laboratory. Uh, my question has to do with trying to get feedback. Um, I took ownership of an idea when you were three years old that would have was a bill in the Congress that would have leveraged the selective service registration part into a one-year debate about civic service. And my experience is since 9-11 is that I get 1% feedback for 100% effort. And I was wondering about setting up an internet website, maybe a wiki, that basically asks that question but challenges mayors, county supervisors, members of the Congress to respond to that idea and document their silence. Is that something that Yahoo might be able to design? Uh, it, possibly, um, but I think that one of the things we really pride ourselves on is being a great publishing platform. You know, and so Tumblr, one of the acquisitions that I did is actually a way for you to, you know, build a following, poll people, really get, get a, an active group of people participating with you on your ideas. Uh, you know, it really prides itself on being the home of the world's creators. And, you know, I would really encourage you to take a look at Tumblr and, you know, there's probably ways that you can use Tumblr and that we might be able to help too. Hello, Marissa. My name is Adi, and I work for a nonprofit in Berkeley. My question is, um, you know, in, I'm a little bit older than you, so for our generation and maybe some of the generations to come, do you think that it might possibly be uh, the biggest regret is spending too much time surfing the web or on sites such as Facebook? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I think that, uh, um, you know, possibly, but I think that it's just amazing to think about how connected we all are now. And you know, that, that someone has a baby, that someone gets married or gets engaged, and you know now within hours, minutes, where you know, that used to be weeks, months, like you know, letters you know, carried through incredible means. And it's just amazing to think about how fast information travels. And I think that the speed of that is something that I really appreciate. And I also think the fact that it, it does come in small bite-sized forms. And so you know, it has less ac activation energy, it has less, uh, it also has, it takes less time to actually read it and understand it. And so um, I certainly think it's something to be mindful of. Um, you know, I heard, I saw this sort of clever headline the other day about, you know, social networking or social not working. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, I think we all want to keep it, you know, like what is actually productive and what just feels productive. There is a difference. Um, but that said, I mean, I, for one, really enjoy having that extra connection to my family and friends and, you know, all the people around me. Well, thank you very much, Marissa. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming tonight. It was a fantastic program. Well done, and congratulations.